Attention pro athletes. Want to secure your financial legacy and thrive off the field? Oak Bridge Wealth Management, led by wealth manager Chris Anasetti, is your dedicated financial planning ally. But don't take it from me. Take it from the Dallas Cowboys, Tyler Biotish. He says, Chris set goals financially and has been incredibly impactful in my journey in the NFL. Experience our customized, comprehensive approach, trusted by top NFL players. Don't leave your financial success to chance. Connect with Chris on Instagram at OakbridgeWM underscore Anaceti. That's OakbridgeWM underscore A-N-I-C-E-T-E. And let Oakbridge Wealth Management guide you across the goal line. to Believe in Badgers on the Believe Network, presented by BetOnline.ag and Oak Bridge Wealth Management. I'm Matt Perkins, joined as always by Badger legend, the Hebrew hammer himself, Matt Bernstein. Bernie, how are we doing today? Dude, every day is a holiday. I'm taking this call from the grandparents' house, and they are on vacation, set at 62, the, the heat, the temperature. And yes, Bob Doherty, I'm a wimp now. I am frozen solid in this place. So I, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that I'm it wrapped up in a north of my North Face jacket and a blanket. And then I'm still freezing. <laughs> well, like Bernie mentioned, we've got Bob Doherty on uh, with us here today, which we are very excited about because – you know, we're questioning Bernie's toughness right now. I know Bob's got a couple uh, stories about uh, how, just really how tough Bernie is. So thank you so much for uh, hopping uh, on with us. Thanks for having me. This is great. Of course, man. Of course. Uh, we're excited. Um, like I said, and we're excited wherever you are tuning in. Want to remind you that we are presented by betonline.ag, where they continue to be your number one source for all of your online sports wagering needs. You name it, they've got it over there at Bet Online. Head on over to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit with our promo code Believe. That's B L E A V. Bet Online, where the game starts. Bernie, where do you want to start today? Well, let's talk about let's talk about where Doherty came from. His look, Bob. Were you ever short, small as a kid? Like you, you were like seven feet tall no. when I remember you. Um, but let's no. let's start let's start with young Bob Doherty up in Oshkosh, uh, playing football. Like what what was that? What how'd you get into it? Um. Well, actually, growing up, um, you know, we I watched a lot of football. Growing up, I mean, it was the Packers. It was a heyday, right? But right, but when you know, we had the Magic Man Mikowski down the road in Green Bay, and um, I can tell you the very moment where I was sitting when Favre took over. <laughs> um, but I never really played a lot of ball. Uh, my folks didn't play organized sports growing up. Um, so actually, a, a, a family friend came to my dad one day and asked, "You know, you got a big kid. Does he want to play football?" And so I picked up in fourth grade and. Um, I was, of course, I had a big X on my helmet because I could never touch the ball and had to be on the line and the whole spiel. So I um, started playing Pee Wee and um, I mean, uh, loved it. You know, it was a, it, it's Wisconsin in the late 80s, early 90s, um, playing Pee Wee football in October. You know, leaves are falling. It's, it's a great time. So I um, started playing line. And then um, in seventh grade, when we got to branch out, it was the first time they moved me to tight end. I wanted to be a quarterback, um, but uh, they moved me to tight end, the end. And from there, I, I stayed there for the rest of the time. So, so when did you think, like, when did you start having success? Like, was it early? Were you like a ninth grader and you're like, wow, I can catch. I'm, I'm doing all these great things. Maybe – I could take this to the next level. Um, well, I, I think early on, I was always told like, you, you know, you're athletic, you're big, but you're too nice. And then all of a sudden in, in sophomore year of high school, I started on varsity and that first game I was like, I can't be nice. These guys are really mean. There's a guy with a tattoo over there. Like, Oh my God. <laughs> um, so that first, that first game, uh, we uh, that first snap. I mean, I was, yeah, you know, your first game at varsity, you're just a ball of nerves, you don't know what it's going to be like. 
And that ball was snapped, and I hit that kid, and the kid kind of gave a little bit. And next thing I know, he's getting pancaked. I'm going up to the linebacker. He's getting pancaked, and I'm like, okay, I think I can do this. And then it just kind of took off from there, sophomore year. So sophomore year was the, the year you're like, wow, I could do this. How tall? Yeah. You were still what, – what, what, what were you, like 6'6"? Six, six? Yeah, yeah, 6'6", six, six, like two – so I was six foot, 200 pounds in sixth grade. And then I hit like my adult size when I was like 14. I dude, I did the, okay. Sorry. Interject Bernie. I've been the exact, I've been my adult size since I was 13, 14 too. Like I yeah, like he's six, I seven, stopped, 285. Look at him. I know. Well, I was, I mean, I was six, three, like I was, I was, I was six, three. And I was like, yes, I'm going to be like six, seven, six, eight. I'm going to be this awesome, massive athlete. Right. Nope. Sorry. No, <laughs> popped out at six three, and in my mom's family, I'm the shortest man, of course. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. No, my cousins are like six seven, six seven, and six six. Uncles are six five. Two of them are six five. My other cousins, my height is six three. Like a bunch of freaking giants. Wow. A bunch of freaking yeah. giants. So, <laughs> I but I mean, so. you must have been around a bunch of freaking giants too, because you know, I assume like if you're that big, your family's probably pretty big, and you were playing around some some big boys up there in northern Wisconsin. Uh, to be honest with you, so dad's pretty tall, pretty built guy. Mom was about six foot, skinny as a rail. Um, and honestly, I mean, besides Darren Charles that we played with, we had guys, um, average side high school players. But there was definitely, uh, I was definitely had a, a leg up on the overall size of the average, especially the, the more skilled like tight ends, DNs. Like 6'4", 230 was kind of the, the max out. So high school was... High school was pretty fun. <laughs> it was pretty fun. Yeah, a little bit. Action. So, well, so as far as like when Wisconsin came in, right off the bat, sophomore year at the end of that year, um, named the all conference. And then I'll never forget my, my high school coach calls me down to this office and I go down there and he hands me his letter and he says, uh, that looks like your journey's starting. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means. I just took it and I left. And as I'm walking back to my classroom, I look down and it's Texas football. And I'm like, Texas football. I mean, this is right after Ricky Williams. This is right. Like, I'm like, what is this? I rip it open and they're inviting me to come down and, and do like a, a camp and a visit and all this other stuff. So I'm, I mean, I'm through the roof. I go home and I give it to my mom and she loses it. My baby's not going to Texas. He's not going da, 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 da. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, and from then on, I mean, it was, uh, there was a lot of recruiting. I mean, there were, they, I had quite a few letters, calls, all that other kind of stuff. Um, but Wisconsin came on as far as sending letters right after sophomore year pretty quickly after that what was after the texas one what was the next school that was like holy crap i can't believe blank school is trying to reach out to me notre dame <laughs> so notre how many dame of these camps like, did you end up going to wisconsin just well I mean, so the, wisconsin's the only place you ever camped at you didn't end, end up going yeah. to camp at any of these other places no none of the other places none just of the other yeah, places Went to camp after junior year, and that's where I got offered, um, which was kind of crazy because I remember, you know, uh, like I've, I've been listening to this podcast for a while now, which is just great, and I'm hearing everybody's stories, and it's all the same. Or like they, they bring you in the back room, it's kind of like a scene from The Godfather, where all of a sudden you're getting pushed in the back, and then there's LV in the corner, and you're seeing the Don, and um, he asks you that question. It's like, who could ever say no in that scenario? Like you're in his office, you're in the middle of this whole thing, and he asks you a question, you're going to say yes, I don't care who you are. Um, but yeah, I was the first one to go through and say yes and went back in the room and there was, um, Darren was there. He got offered the same time. Um, and I think, uh, I don't remember who else it was. Oh, Taj. Taj was there and he was getting escorted around in JP's, uh, white, um, Cadillac and he had, he committed then too. That's quite a group yeah, of guys all got committed the, at the uh, same time. Yeah. 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 I think there may have been one other person there. I don't remember, uh, but that those are definitely the ones that stick out. Yeah. Was um was did you and DC go through kind of this journey together? Completely together. 
it was um, super special. So Darren never, <laughs> Darren never played freshman year football, um, and then came out sophomore year, and they put him at wide receiver. And I mean, he was good right off the bat. I mean, you throw a fade to him in high school, even a slant, like he, he definitely developed over the years. But we played a game against a guy named Eric Jensen, who we ended up playing against when we played Iowa in 2002. He was at a school that we played against in high school. And it was a real close game. It's a good team. We went for two to win the game. And Darren, the ball was thrown a little high and went through Darren's hands. And I'll, I kid you not, that was sophomore year. Darren, in junior year and senior year, after catching probably 200 balls, he never had another drop. Not one time in high school did he drop another ball. It was, and I mean, some of the catches he had were insane. Just like mossing kids left and right. Oh, it was it was so crazy. Yeah, but he could also. I mean, he was so like he could also just like even in college, just run, just kind of like put his hand up, like do the Randy Moss thing, and just be like, yeah, just throw me the ball. I'm gonna run by this person because I'm taller, faster. (laughs) He did everything. He did anything he wanted to, and it was in, in high school. It was like. You know, he, so they put him off for track, and he's like, "I've never done track before." Hey, I'm gonna high jump seven feet. It's like, dude, come on. You know, <laughs> it was unbelievable. Basketball, never really played basketball. I'll just drop thirty against a crosstown rival. No big deal. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what that's what he was. That's what he is. So Bob, so so Bob, you're saying that was your official visit when you went and they took you in the back, and you're like, "Yeah, I'm jumping in," or that was well, that even was before. Camp. That's when I that's when I verbally committed. That was after junior year of high school going into senior year of high school. Yeah, the official visit then was the end of uh, senior year with the cookie and the, the whole spiel, yeah. yeah. Who was your, ho- Wait, who was so your host who was- for that? Who was your host for, for the official, I guess, Brian? Al Johnson. Really? Yep, it was Al Johnson. Yeah, he had that that uh, old explorer. We went roaming around. Um, <laughs> we went roaming around Madison, his old explorer. Um Wait, yeah. so Al Johnson was a, a senior? He was a redshirt junior. He was he had two he had one more year left or two more years? Two. Two more years. Two. Yeah, so you had an upperclassman, like a way upperclassman as your host. That must have and I know Al Johnson, and he was a pretty yeah. fun dude. Was that a wild time? You don't have to get into all the it details, was. but it was, it was pretty wild. I'm, I mean at at that time I was uh I wasn't as experienced in the Madison lifestyle um, as I was <laughs> shortly after that. Um, so I, it wasn't quite as wild as it, it soon became, um, but it was definitely a good time. I mean, he was a great guy, great host. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and to, <laughs> so funny story about how like naive. So we went to the Avenue for the steak that I heard what Casey was talking about the steak on his podcast. It was a great story. But Darren and I were so naive at this official visit. We're sitting with Nick Koshart, Benning, Al Johnson, and I think even Ben Johnson. And you know, like, that's not a table full of non judgmental guys for a couple of recruits to sit next to, right? Like, they're, they're, they're judging you right off the bat. So they bring out this beautiful prime rib, and we have no idea what prime rib is. We asked him to take it back and cook it more. And I'll never forget the look on Nick Koshart's face that I was like, who are these bumpkins you guys are recruiting? They're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we had no idea and then the waitress is like all right i guess we'll take this prime rib back and cook the heck out of it yeah <laughs> man that's a table though ben johnson <laughs> scared me for so many years and then yeah, he just was nice like, to me yeah that's all he did that whole dinner to stare chew and stare <laughs> <laughs> How about, much prime rib was consumed like at that dinner is my question. Um, oh, there was there were a lot of cows that went down that day. A lot of cows. <laughs> okay, so you end up coming to Wisconsin that following summer, and you end up in the seminary. First of all, what was your – were you ready for that? How mentally, physically, emotionally – and I mean, no. you guys got to know each other very well uh, while you yeah. were there. So sort of <laughs> yes, walk did. us through your process yeah. of arriving in Madison and then getting uh, out to the seminary. So, I mean, you know, going back a little bit too, coming out of high school, um, Darren and I were both pretty high recruits. 
and we were recruited pretty heavily. We both committed to Wisconsin early. And for me, Wisconsin was the only school. I mean, that was right at the Rose Bowls, Dane, like, I remember just even thinking about watching that 23 yard run when he broke the record. I remember running home and watching that game. I still get goosebumps thinking about it, you know? Um, so it was, I mean, to be able to be there and to play was just amazing. So you show up there and you still think it's the recruiting process. All these coaches are your buddies and are going to give you hugs when you show up. And we get dropped off there for freshman camp and walk in the gym and then all the stuff is on the gym floor. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's kind of weird, but it's cool. And I found my little bag full of stuff. I'm like, holy cow, free gloves, shoes. This is great. Da, da, da. We get up to the room and I meet this guy and he's got this New York accent and he's just, he's, he's like talking a million miles an hour. And the first night you go to bed and you're nervous and somehow you go to sleep. And I wake up that first morning and there's no door on the bathroom. There's no door on the room, nothing like that. And I look up and he's sitting on the toilet staring at me. And he's just got his head around the corner and he's talking to me like we've known each other our whole lives. And he's like, dude, what do you think today's going to be like? Do you think we're going to do this? Do you think we're going to do that? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'm laying in the bed and I'm like, why did I pick the bed that looks into the bathroom? There's no time. <laughs> never done that. Never done that. And I'll be honest with you, we were there for 21 days. And all 21 days, I woke up. He's asking me questions from that toilet all 21 days. <laughs> I, 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 I will say that that is true. All of that is 100% yeah. true. And I still do that to my wife, and she hates it. She's like, let me wake up. Let me wake up. I'm like, no, no, no. What do you think today's going to be like? Hey, what's going on? That's, that's what, all of a sudden, like, I would kind of move, and you'd just be in there waiting for, to hear the bed sheets move a little bit. And then a head would pop around, and you'd be like, hey, what do you think today's going to be like? Do you think we're going to I'm like, dude, burn. I just, oh, my God. I was just dreaming that we weren't here, and now we're <laughs> well, well, Doc, they also – the problem with that place was it was 900 degrees. They didn't tell you to bring a oh. fan. We showed up with all the stuff we owned for the – and then no one tells you there's no door on a toilet, like in the bathroom. No. That, yeah. to me, was the most bananas thing to ever happen. You assimilated quick, though. It was – like you, <laughs> you embraced that really quick. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pretty out there type of human being, Bob. I think you know that. <laughs> At one perfect. point, you, what can you do? Like, you have to embrace it. Yeah. Uh, I have nothing yeah, else to, to do. 100%. But, but, so, wait, so Bob, walk us through that because you took off at that camp. So, walk us through like what your experience outside of like having these, you know, really deep conversations with, with me uh, at like 6 15 in the morning. What was camp like for you? And, and how, how quick did you take to it? Um, who was your coach also? Tim Tim Davis. It was Tim Davis, right. Okay, right, right, right. So yeah. what was what was your experience at camp like? And then, you know, you started getting with the ones. Like, that must have been awesome. It was awful. <laughs> like, the, the camp was awful. Like, there's nothing – just nothing fun about it. You wake up at 5.30 in the morning. You've got this guy talking to you from the toilet. You're, you're scared to death you're going to miss – or be late to any of the 487 things you have to do in a day. It, it was just, it was crazy. I mean, the, the, the install, the, the verbiage, the, I mean, it, it was just a whirlwind from jump and there was no transition. We had our three days where all the freshmen are together. Um, but I think that was even a ploy to make us even more psychologically broken down because you get a little confidence and then they just crush it when Darius Jones and Erasmus James and Jake Sprague and Ben Herbert, Nick Riley, they oh, just crush your hopes and dreams instantly. Uh, the speed, the, the practices, the fact that practices, you know, I think a lot of high school kids now – practice the way we did in college but from us coming from high school and we had a good good high school program our high school coaches were great never heard of periods you never heard of indie install like nine on seven that wasn't a thing so then all of a sudden have this organized thing and then to watch film oh that film room i can still smell it like it's it's crazy how the transition was and yeah um, even that summer before we went to work out, the first time we did stadium stairs. And Bernie, were you there that summer before? You were, right? 
Do you remember the first time we ran those stadium stairs and we did eight of them and that one guy hid in the press box and we had to come down and run, run cross fields? I thought this is, this is, someone has to go to prison for this. <laughs> it was Dude, just crazy. They used to say, don't show up in the summer on a Tuesday. And every single person for some odd reason showed up. I showed up on a Tuesday and I was up there running. And even dudes like Calvin Barrett, who I love to death, but he was yeah. not in great physical shape. He was running up and down doing it. And I was dying the whole time dying. running by Calvin Absolutely Barrett, dying. who's like 300. Yeah. And there's, there's aspects of the stadiums when you're coming down and you realize you look down and you're like, Oh man, if my legs give out and I go down, that wall is going to support me. And then you get to the bottom of the press box and you realize it's only a foot and a half high. Nope. You're going right over. <laughs> Dude, I, I would say Doc, what, what was shocking to me was the, the gravitas of like, they put, they took speakers out and were blasting music at the stadium. Like, all these things, the magnitude of the training and how, you know, like you watch these dudes who are coming in, working their asses off. Sorry, mom mm-hmm. and Carrie for saying asses on, on um, the podcast. But like I worked out in high school. This was not even close to what high no. school was like. So you, everything you're saying is right. The the change, I was oh. I had no chance at, at camp my first year. I was a jabroni. I couldn't pick up what was going down. I was getting my butt kicked. Nick Grison had a he was having a all you can eat field day every day against me. And all I could say is you gotta get through it. Once you get through that one, it's like, all right, I'm you know, but you but Bob, you were playing. You you were gonna be a player in a game. I had I was just a guy on the sideline. What yeah. was that? It was it was a lot because um but at the same point, like you guys knew you were going to go to the scout team and be beaten for a year. We, I got to, and I don't say you had it a little easier, but we kind of did. And knowing that Thursday was the um, like walkthrough day, Friday was definitely the walkthrough day. Saturday you traveled, you got to eat that in towner meal, like that fried fish. Come on now, um, it was. It, there were benefits to being destroyed during the week and during camp, you know. Uh, but at the same point, like there was an also a lot more expectation, especially as a true freshman. I mean, everything you did was wrong. Everything you did was wrong. And then Mark and Ellie would come in and do something and it was perfect. Look what Mark did. I'm like, dude, I just did the same thing. And you're like, no, you didn't. Like, yes, I did. I just did the same thing. And then all of a sudden, like he would get, he would miss one block and they'd be like, oh, it's all right, Mark. You'd miss one block. And it was like, you were getting ostracized. I was like, well, wait a minute. This is craziness. Like, I don't understand. Um, but there was, I mean, it, it was a, a huge transition in itself. And then when he started transitioning towards that first game against Virginia our freshman year, and we got into that, like, game prep week, it got even more insane because then, like, every rep mattered. Now you needed to know who are you going against, what's the scouting report, did you watch film, did you – it was just – it was a natural role in did you work out? Did you go to like, class? There was so, yeah. There was just so much that pe- I guess it, there's so much not just within the football pillar, but the the the, the academic pillar, and then mm-hmm. they demanded you do X, Y, and Z that nobody knows about, right? They would give us DVDs no. so you'd go home and watch your film at home too. I mean that would yeah. so it's like got to the point where you're like. Man, I'm literally just doing football all day, and there's a little time for like going to class. If you went mm-hmm. to class because you had to wake up at five o'clock in the morning to work out, and Bob, were you still in the developmental lift group on Sundays? Oh yeah. So you were starting or playing a lot, and had to go to the lift group on that through the lift group. Like there are a lot of things that broke my back my, my freshman year, but that 11 a.m. lift group into the run. I was like, man, I hate everything about lifting right now. I okay. said, I think about it. So you were the, first, re- the first few weeks I had to do that developmental lift. And then when Schultz got hurt and I started going like the permanent too deep, I didn't have to go that lift anymore. And I was like, this is, I'm never getting out of the too deep again. There's no, there's no way I'm ever getting out of the too deep again. Never. No. Mm-mm. So, Doc, you talk about Marcinelli, 
And to me, I, I cherished his friendship as a young person because he really included us, I think. Oh, what yeah. was he like as a as like a mentor slash – did he take you under his wing? Like what did he teach you? What was his your relationship was, with him? I called him – you know, affectionately, I called him dad there because he really was. Like he, he took you directly under the wing. Um, he, every like, – he'd always constantly give you tips, constantly. And not just about – the play, but he would also tell you like, you know, be here, watch film at this time. This is what you're looking for. Um, make sure you get in on time, get on debt's good side, be on bot's good side. Like everything about it, make sure you go to school. Don't park here. Don't park there. Uh, ride your scooter there. If it's 75 degrees on a Sunday, like he knew everything. He knew everything about making it work there. And he happily shared it. And if you had a problem or if you had a bad day, if you had a bad day, sometimes he'd come down and sit next to you and hit you in the back of the head if you needed a, a, a pick-me-up. Um, if you needed to get your butt chewed on top of getting your butt chewed by everybody else, he'd do it. But he was also the first guy that if you made a good play, he would spank you on the butt or give you a high five or a slap on the helmet. He was the first guy to do it. Um, he was the best. And it was and it was it was really hard the second sophomore year taking over. I mean, it was like um the fact that he gave me his number for my second year meant so much. Um, and to try and fill those shoes that next year, it was impossible to fill those shoes. He was, he was great. So, Doc, we got to talk. We get out. First off, the best one of the best days of my life was getting on that yellow school bus at, at the seminary with all of my yeah. gear. And we move into yeah. the towers. Oh, the okay. fifth floor crew. It's you. <laughs> DC, Pose, and yeah. Kleber in one Kleber, room. Yeah. And me, yeah. OD, Isaac Ballou, and Matt Lawrence Isaac. on the other side. Yes. Yes. What a wild floor. What on – you? There, I mean, that point, that was a wild time to be alive in the towers with a football team living there. Whoever owned that building must have just hated us. I mean, <laughs> like the – the screens coming off the windows instantly, the the snowball fights, the the filling up the garbage cans and leaning them against the door and knocking on the door and running away so that all the water pours into the room. Um, oh, it was just – it was endless, man. The the dynamic lap in the hallway and just your shorts for no reason at 10 o'clock at night. Like, yeah, that, that place was nonstop. It was nonstop fun. You'd go – you'd just wander into these tiny little rooms. And to think about how many of us fit into those, like – what were they, eight by eight or whatever rooms? You just fill that thing full of these people, and you just had a great time. You know, you're sitting on top of one another, constantly doing something. Um, and Yeah, it was an absolute blast. Every day was a blast. Every day was a blast. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how else to say it besides, like, you can constantly hang out with your buddies at your dorm, and then we just – took our scooters down to the stadium and hung out with our buddies there. Yes. There was a lot of other pressures and other things going on. We took the same class. Yo doc. Mm -hmm. I remember we were in, was it clap for credit or maybe it was a history lecture in the humanities building. I took a lot you of laid down for behind. The, it was a probably clap for credit. You laid behind, behind yeah. the chairs and fell asleep with your cell phone on your chest. And every one of us kept calling you and it would ring out loud. <laughs> And you didn't wake up at all. You just kept – and they were getting so – the dude was getting so bad because the phone kept ringing and ringing. And we were just looking at each other and like – it was like, all right, you're out. Calm down. Because I sat across on the other side. And I'm like, get him. And we just – oh, man, it was so funny. Oh, my God. That's right. Yes. Oh, my God. I totally forgot about that. Totally <laughs> forgot about that. You know, I forgot I – I wanted to mention a camp. One, the hazing thing when they would come up and get you, yeah, on the, on the on the freshman floor, I will never forget when we knew they were coming up, we could hear them, and I was like, "Oh God, here we go!" And we we're, I was, I looked at you, like, "What are we going to do for our defenses?" And you looked me dead in the eye, and that's the, the the only time you were ever serious to me. You looked at me and you said, "We're going to take it. We're going to stand here, and we're going to take it." And I'm like, "Oh, okay, all right, Bernie." I'll never forget the look in their eyes. And they came in here expecting us to run and we didn't budge. And they were like, 
okay, guys. And then everyone just kind of nodded and was like, okay, we know where they stand. Awesome. They still roughed <laughs> us up and threw your stuff in the shower. <laughs> but but it was it, it, that was some of yeah. the best advice ever. It was just like you looked at me and you said, we're not running anywhere. We're just going to take it. And I'm like, yeah. that's my boy. That's my boy right there. You can yeah. talk to me in the morning on the toilet also, anytime. The morning- that's fine. <laughs> the more you fight it, the more they're just going to keep coming after you. I was like, man, let's that's just exactly get what this you over. Said. That's exactly what you said. Is that they're just going to get this regardless. Like, we'll just, just do it. Let's go. Uh, it, and, and another thing I loved, like when they would tape up a freshman, and then it was like, all right, the next person to help him is getting taped up, and but you couldn't leave your boys there, so it was like this round robin circle of just like utter stupidity. And to be yeah. honest, like. It wasn't that bad. You just it, no. it, tape on your hair on your arms was really annoying. But outside of that, yeah. like, didn't really. It wasn't that bad. No, it wasn't. If you just if you took it and you you proved them that you want to be part of the team and you got through it, they'd left you alone and you were part of the team. If you kept fighting it, some of those guys got it kind of bad. Some it got a little bad for some of them, but but yeah, you just right. took it. And right. You earned their respect. That's what you did. Attention, athletes. Do you want a frictionless and tailored financial planning experience to secure your future? Well, look no further. Introducing Oak Bridge Wealth Management, the premier financial planning firm for professional athletes. Led by wealth manager, Chris Anasetti. Our team provides a unique and comprehensive approach, ensuring your financial success both on and off the field. We understand the unique challenges you face as a professional athlete, from managing cash flow habits to planning major business purchases and navigating complex contracts. That's why we've developed a proven process, working closely with our strategic partners to provide seamless solutions for your unique financial journey. Our services evolve with your career, offering short, mid, and long-term goal setting, portfolio optimization, real estate investments, and more. As you transition to life beyond the field, we support you with career development and philanthropic ventures. But don't just take our word for it. Top NFL players like Chase Roulier, Tyler Biotish, Alec Ingold, and more trust Oak Bridge Wealth Management to guide them towards financial success. Troy Dye of the Minnesota Vikings says, I really love the work that Chris and the rest of the Oak Bridge group do. I especially like the honesty and transparency when it comes to setting up financial goals and plans that best fit my needs and situation. It's time to elevate your financial game plan. Connect with Chris on Instagram at OakbridgeWM underscore Anacete. That's OakbridgeWM underscore A-N-I-C-E-T-E. And join the winning team. All right, so the Towers is wild. Any fun stories from the Towers, Doc, that is PG-17? Well, I... Give or take. I do remember. I don't. I can't say for sure if you're part of this, and if you're if your mom was listening, I'm going to say you weren't. But we would go in the elevator, and we would have shorts, and we would hold them around our waist, but we didn't have any like pants on in the backside. And then people would ride up, and we'd get off, and they'd like see our backsides, and they would realize that <laughs> we did that quite often. That was that was some good times. But as as far as like PG. DG said, nah, I don't know about uh, the, the the tower stories. The, the garbage cans were a big one, man. That was a, always constantly, constantly. You hear a door knock, you open up, and you get water in there, and you're like, oh, brutal. You started not opening your door. I remember starting to walk down. We'd go through to Isaacs and uh, Matt Lawrence and open that. I would always open their door to be like, oh, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> I haven't hit enough times with this stupid water thing. <laughs> Dude, um. I remember a couple things from the towers. One, the patty melt that they made at in the cafeteria underneath oh, yeah. was bananas delicious. Yes. I gained like yes. 15 pounds of freshman year eating that and everything else I could find and drinking every single thing I could find also that was at the towers, which was great. Um, I remember when they would pull the fire alarm alarm at an overnight. First of all, uh, I'd be so mad. Like, none of you losers are getting up at five in the morning to work out. And I have no, this it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm not going to go back to sleep, but I'm going to go under my bed and hide. So when the yes. fire department comes up, uh, they won't see me. Do you remember like yeah. 
I would put suitcases in, bet- in, in so no one could see. Dude, God forbid the building was on fire. I was a goner. Like, I was I under there. Was- to go back to it always went through my head, like, is this one for real? And yet at that point, you're yeah. like, you know what? Take me. Because otherwise, I got to go to Lyft and see debt at 6 o'clock in the morning. You know what? Take me. I'm done. I'm ready. I'm, I'm tired. Ready. Take me. <laughs> I'm, I'm all and, done. Like, I'm all done. And and first off, that, that one year alone – has changed my outlook on like being early to every single thing I do. But oh, yeah. I remember having my pants with my belt in, everything in my pockets, keys, cell phone, because like you didn't need it really because it was didn't do anything at this time. Boots, socks. I would wear my socks and the underwear I was going to wear on. And then I had a T-shirt also. So when I got out of bed, I literally put my feet into my pants, pulled them up, put them on, put my t-shirt on, brush my teeth, put my sweatshirt jacket on, I was out the door in like five to seven minutes. Oh, yeah. That's how oh, yeah. bananas yeah. that was. And that whole time you were brushing and just like, you're just trying to get that brush in, you got to get there. By the time you got there, you already had a pump in your tricep. You were just ready to go. Yeah, and then to ride on <laughs> those blizzards down University Ave and those scooters, you had to have your feet out. And yeah, I, oh, man, it was just, it was, it was, <laughs> It was not glorious. You know, you watch the program. The program came out right before we went in, and we anticipated it was going to be like this awesome, glorious, every day is a, a magical thing. It's not, man. It is unbelievably hard work. And I still tell people, I remember to this day, like my freshman year schedule from morning till end, every single night, 5.30 or 6 a.m. till 10 o'clock at night, every night, every night. It was nonstop, nonstop. It's crazy. Yeah, because we go to practice. And then you would go to mm-hmm. training table to eat dinner. And then they said you had yep. to be here at, at seven o'clock. We had to be in the Fetzer for two hours. Yep. For two studying. hours driving, just driving Scott Cavan on nuts. He hated us all. <laughs> he hated driving us. him nuts. And there was oh. no cell phone. Theory. There was no real, like you Not. couldn't call anyone because you were down underneath. They didn't work. The computers had, remember what was that game? It was like a pinball. Uh, it was a pool game on some like, old 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 technology website that had a couple yeah, yeah. games and we would go and play yeah. it like you could not believe and Kavanaugh would find mm-hmm. us and be pissed that we were oh, playing games so and not bad. doing it but all we did so was bad. mess around because what do you do for two hours but you, you can only do so much homework and then you didn't want to do it and also dude at nine o'clock at night to drive back to the towers to literally watch people get ready to go out and you're like now nah, I gotta do this tomorrow 5.30 yep. wake up. Yep. It was it, it was ruthless. Now, I wouldn't give it up for the world because our experience is so much different than a normal person's life. But we can talk about it. But how great was the offseason when literally <laughs> Wednesdays you could go out, Tuesday nights, and nothing to do Wednesday. And then you go out Friday, Saturday night. And I remember putting work in those days. Like – it was beer, beer, beer. We're gonna eat, let's drink, and we're not it thinking was about way Pokemon. too great. <laughs> way too great. That off season was like, wait a minute, we can do, we can do what? We can. <laughs> wait a minute, what? <laughs> we don't have. I mean, okay. They, and they still tried to make it hard to do those things because they would have yeah. a Friday. You do like like circuit, and then in the afternoon we go back and do. So they want you to miss FAC. But the one, the couple times they let us go to FAC, people, it's like it's like I remember the first time I had a beer for everyone. It's like they let us out mm-hmm. these animals out into the wilderness, and people were. I remember I was. People were just bombed out doing crazy mm-hmm. things. If looking back on what we must have looked like coming into those places, I think animals is the only way to describe it. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's this is the only way. I mean, we just rushed into these places and took over like locusts. I mean, it was feral. I think that's the word I would feral, feral. Man. Like seriously, it was. I mean, every place we went into was just like boom, here we are. I mean, big, but but all great guys. I mean, everyone was such great, and that was another thing about camp too. It was terrible, but that half hour before you went into that last team meeting with Elvie at night at camp. I mean, everyone just to get together, and that's that's where you made that team. I mean, it was that was literally a, a cohesive brotherhood. So quickly, and it was, I mean, you still had like your your upper echelon senior guys and your freshman guys, but still your team. You knew who your team was. 
you knew who your guys were and no matter what, you know, it was, it was a close knit group. It was, it's an awful experience, but it's something I definitely, I do, I would never go back and do it again, but I do cherish, um, I do cherish those times immensely. So doc, so let's, let's, let's go on to now we move to the region, which is pretty funny because now it's you, Kleber, was, was, was DC, across, you guys are literally across the hall. It could have been the stupidest thing that ever happened to the region. <laughs> it was me and Jason Polaro. Yeah. And it was Kleber, yep. you, was Jeff Lang in that? Stelly. 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 Stelmacher. And, so and we're DC? at camp this sophomore year and he's a walk-on. No, because we each had their own room, right? So wow. Stelly came up to me and he asked, he's like, I'll save money if you room up with me. And then because I roomed with somebody, I would get like, I don't know, $225 a month or whatever it was, which was, oh, I mean, rich at that time. Um, so, yeah, we, we were roommates there. Cleaver had his own room and you and J-Po were across the hall. And I mean, just every night, like door would open up, Bernie would come in, no shirt on, athletic shorts and an entire frozen pizza and just be rolled up like a taco, eating a frozen pizza after we ate training table a half hour ago because he's starving. <laughs> just talking talking about life, sitting in the living room of the region, staring out that window, looking at the stadium like, dude, we got 4.30 lift tomorrow. Oh, my God. But, yeah, the region was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, like – you just go into different people's rooms. You go down there. Johnny Sill was, was shaving somebody's head or doing somebody's hair down there on the second floor. Uh, Taj's room was always, everyone was in there doing their thing in Taj's room. Like it's just so much fun. You just constantly roll in those halls. You just constantly roll in the halls and every one of those rooms and halls looked the exact same, but you knew like exactly would you get off of any floor and know exactly oh, I'm on the third floor because this door has this little scratch in it? Because you're through those halls so many times in different people's rooms. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, I, I had to pay the region so much money for breaking things um, because of Kleber. That's all I'm going to say. I Do you know how much a, a fire extinguisher cost in circa 2002? Because I do. I, I shot so many at your door. For Cleaver, like throwing stuff at our door, and literally, granted, it's five feet, ten feet across a hall, five, eight feet across a hall. They kept, they would write me letters. This is your last opportunity. You, you know, this is how you. They used to get me, though, Doc. They'd be like, "This is your last opportunity until we call your daddy, uh, Barry oh, yeah. Alvarez." You're not paying for this fire extinguisher. I was like, "No, no, no. How much is it? Yeah. I'll give you guys more." Just don't tell him. No matter what, whatever you do, do not tell him a thing. Don't tell him a thing. Yeah, I know. Don't Cleaver, tell Jamie. Cleaver, so, yeah. I, he was the worst instigator that's ever lived. Man, he just – the worst instigator. Like he, he would tell you to do something. You'd be like, that's a terrible idea. 30 seconds later, you're doing it. And you're like, how am I doing this? How, how am I doing this? I don't know. We had the slingshots in the quarters in our room, and we shot like the, the microwave with it. We shot the walls. There's all these holes along the drywall. And before we leave there, uh, Cleaver's dad shows up, Steve, and he comes in and he's got all this putty, all this paint, all this other stuff. He puts it on the the, comp, the table and he sits down. He's got a six pack of beer and he's like, there you go, boys. Learn how to learn how to drywall. <laughs> We're in there spackling. I had no idea how to do anything. <laughs> um, six pack yeah, of Bud Light. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's exactly oh, what it was. Also, Doc. Uh, it was a six pack of Bud Light. He, he, if you ever go golfing with Steve Kleber, you will know that he has them everywhere in his bag. It is the funniest thing. He never needs a beer. You never have to buy him one. He never needs one because he has like them right. slow pace. Um, also, Doc, what I remember about th the region is that the OP was right there. Oh, yeah. The open pantry. That place was open for me to buy alcohol every day there. It was yes. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every day, every like, and you'd go in there once a week, and you get gas for your scooter, and I would get a tin every, I don't know, two days or whatever of of, of uh, Kodiak. I could fill up my scooter and get a tin of Kodiak for a dollar seventy five. Walk yeah. up, <laughs> you should like go quick. You had to go real carefully with the, the scooter gas, or it would shoot <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the good old it, it old just was an old 
Yeah, it just <laughs> poured out of there. Absolutely poured out of there. Yeah, the region. I mean, oh, so <laughs> yeah, the region was just uh, absolutely absurd. Again, like the fact that we could, we were actually allowed to live indoors at that time is mind boggling to me because we never should have. But like around other human beings. Oh yeah, we should. They should have just kept us at the seminary until we earned our way out of there. Because this, it's, it's <laughs> absurd. It's absolutely absurd. Just living with the nuns and and the and the fathers and the like, <laughs> hey, you guys, you didn't earn your hey, Matt Bernstein, you didn't earn your way out of here. We know <laughs> all. <of you>. Wow. <laughs> I gotta get you, you back in here. You will be here for the <laughs> long run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the region was nice though, because then, like, when we started getting to those house parties in that area, it was a much shorter distance back, back to the region instead of the towers. That was nice. Much shorter. So, Doc, what are some of your like, fondest moments um, on the field? On the field, um, I would definitely say, well, uh, the the Michigan game, my freshman year, uh, the one that we missed the field goal to to win. Um, was probably one of my fondest memories because that really, like the first time playing Michigan was was just such a great time. Um, the crowd was different. Um, everything about that game was just so different. And um, really felt like we were going to do it. We were finally going to break that streak, and we were so close to it. Um but that, that was a really fond memory of just that fight with that team. Um, then Fresno State the next year, the night game, the, the the kickoff classic at night, like that was that was a magical game. Nick Burley, the rest of Fresno State, like the, the Bernard Berrien was on that team. Uh, the fact that we came back and won that game, you know, that was that was really special. That was a lot of fun. Of course, the Alamo Bowl going there was a blast. That was a blast. Doc, I have a really cool picture of you. Um, blocking for one of those touchdowns against when we played West Virginia at home oh, that year. Big helmet, big face mask, like just so yeah. funny to look yeah. at all these no, ridiculous. I, yeah, they gave me one like a helmet like they had from the '60s my freshman year, and then when they realized I was actually starting the next year, they gave me the really nice one, and it was like a space helmet. I was like, is there anything in between? Like, can I just get <laughs> something in between this? <laughs> can we just get a regular? Regular. I'll never get. So I think it was, it may have been bowl practice, or spring ball or something, but you made a great block, Bernie, and and Coach White was so fired up, and we get in the huddle, and you and I were next to each other in the huddle, and Coach White came up and he gave you a swat across the head, bam, because he was so excited, and he walks away, and you literally look at me and you go, dude, I just smoked my head in that block. And now he hit me in the head. <laughs> and you're just so confused as to why, like, why he hit you in the head. Your head, your eyes are kind of spinning. Like, oh my god. <laughs> one of my one of my pet peeves after after figuring this out quickly was I hated hitting people in the helmets because no. we all we did was take hits in our freaking helmets. Yeah. So that's why I became a big ass slapper because it didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> and I just, I just, I went, I just went into, I was like, you know what? This is where it's going to be. Cause if you slap someone on the back, sometimes it could hurt them. Usually on the tush didn't really hurt. And I hated hitting people in the helmet only because we were taking shots. And usually I had a headache most of the time, which isn't probably a good thing for my future, but <laughs> dude, coach white would get so pumped and just oh, wow up you on the hel- helmet. And I'd oh, be yeah. like, Dude, Dude just, on, just give, me, give me a second. I'm just kind of coming back to where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> what am I? <laughs> a lot of funny things in the in, in the in the uh, huddle all the time. Oh yeah, man. Yep. Just standing there, and, and Brooks would have his hand on your on your head. You know, when like we were leaning forward, the next thing you know, he'd like take his finger and like like touch your neck with it, and you're like, "Dude, what the? Get off me! What are you doing? <laughs> just mess with you like that?" Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man this has been too fun <laughs> i will say like getting my hit in the head Bernie, my, my, yeah. one of my favorite oh, memories of all time being with you out on the town was there was a, a party going on and it was in this big apartment complex where there was like a there's only one way into the 
center area. And then all these like condos were up there. And then there was like a big courtyard in the middle. There was one way in. Then there was a fence on one side. And the cops bust in this thing. And it's, I mean, there's all sorts of people there. And then so we bail. And in the side by the fence, I mean, there's, there's a cyclone fence and then there's a wooden fence. And so majority of us like hop, skip and jump over this fence and we're running and we just hear this crunch and we look back behind us and you're standing up and there's just these, there's still shards of wood raining down from the, from the air and you're standing up. You ran, you bent a cyclone fence right over to the ground and shattered this wooden fence like a cartoon, like a Tasmanian devil. And you're standing up and you're just kind of like getting up and you just go, whoa. And you start running. And we're like, okay, we're good. <laughs> I mean, Honestly, I probably didn't even see the fence. Any, each and every one of them I didn't see. I just, saw, I just heard cops and I just jetted. Yeah. And all of us stood there and watching you stand up like, he just destroyed a cyclone fence. I mean, it was completely bent to the ground like someone drove over it. it Hell was yeah. Amazing. It was- By the way, Doc, you, you took me up. One of my favorite experiences I still remember today is that you took me up to Country Fest oh in Oshkosh. Yeah. And it was you, me, yeah, Cleaver, DC. There's a couple other people. That was one of my we just I just drank beer all night. It was yeah. raining a little bit. Like yeah. we couldn't I couldn't sleep in the tent. No, no it was Cleaver too tried to sleep in his car. Yeah. Do you remember that next morning? I mean, yeah, kind of. It was so it's the sun is coming up. So now we're getting that hot, humid air in the tent, and we're still trying to sleep this hangover off. And there's a guy like five tents down, and he wants to fight us. And he's yelling this and that and the other thing. And you get up and you got these blaze orange boxer shorts on and one boot and you climb out of this tent and you got, that's all you're wearing. And you just walk out and you go, what? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> the guy just sees you down there and he goes right back in his tent. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to fight that guy. <laughs> these guys, and that was it. That was uh, it. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't shut the hell up. No. And we're like, dude, stop screaming at us. We're going to end this in a – you're not going to like it. It's because we were talking to their they, – they they had female friends that they, they were took there. And oh. no surprise, they liked us better because, you know, we were kind of awesome. Um, and also, I'm with th- – think about this. I'm with you in D.C. who are who are kind of locals. I'm with yeah. Kleber who's like my bash brother. And I am drinking beer. I have no – I'm like, I got these huge dudes with me. I am not scared. This was probably some of my some of my time at, at, in Wisconsin whenever, like, Clink was around. I'm like, I can oh, yeah. try to fight everyone in here because no one's going to mess with me because Clink's got my back. And it was the exact same thing. But these dudes wouldn't stop hemming and hawing at, at us. And I was like, you know what? I was like, shut the hell up. Because the whole camp was annoying too. I mean, it was like just mm-hmm. tense up and down, left and right everywhere. The moment he saw you come out in your underwear, he's like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to mess with that man. Right, tasty white, just blinding. <laughs> <in college>. oh. <laughs> Got those white ankles from the ankle tape that never saw the sun. <laughs> I was probably drinking a bush light too. <laughs> probably. Probably, man. Oh, that's oh, yeah. too funny. Good old country fest, man. Well, we don't have you here for a whole lot longer, uh, unfortunately. But I wanted to sort of jump way, way ahead. What do yeah. you do? You know, what is post football Bob Doherty doing now? And how did you sort of get to where you are today? And I also want to talk to you about I know you're training Michael Roski, who also yeah. um, or spent some time with Michael Roski, who is um, coming to the Badgers very soon. So, how did you mm-hmm. end up? in Watoma and then working with one of the top offensive linemen in the state and the country, who's going to be a future badger. And what sort of advice have you had for him? Um, so long tail. I, once I got done, you know, uh, playing ball, um, I wanted to be a firefighter. And so it was like 2006. Everyone wanted to be a firefighter. Somehow Jeff Lang actually made it and has made an amazing career out of it. Um, but, uh, I, I, I could never find it. It was always like a few things short on the tests and this, that, and other thing. So I ended up joining uh, during the Navy to get some veterans points. And I was a Navy corpsman for five years. And then I decided that, 
I wanted to actually be a, a, a provider and I was too old to become a, a doctor at that time because uh, I was still going to be and I was going to be 30 by the time I got out of the Navy. So I became a, a nurse practitioner instead and working in the ER um, and I met my wife when I came back to go to nursing school um, who's from Wisconsin and we're living now in smack dab of Wisconsin. Um, do little kids and, and working in the ER and stuff. And it's, it's, it's been a good transition. Um, I've been, uh, it's amazing how fast time flies. I went back to the Michigan game and saw Danny Benning and Ben Johnson a few years ago, and then realized it had been 20 years since I saw those guys in you burn. It's been 20 years. Like, I mean, the last time I saw you, you were in the basement with shoats and bell and shaves. And I came down there to visit you guys and you were so excited. You jumped out of your bed and you put your head right through the ceiling and there was a hole. You didn't even flinch. You were just so excited. You know, it was, it's been so long, but you know, and that's the thing too, like the seminary does to you. I and mean, we would see each other in 20 years, but it's a brotherhood, man, forever, forever yeah. and ever. So, um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I got to post football, and it's it's a weird thing. Sometimes I look up and I'll see like a, a picture that we have or something or the jersey, and I'm like, well, "That really happened." It was 20 years ago. Most of these kids weren't alive, but but that really did happen. Um, and as far as Mike goes, uh, so Stelmacher is lives very close. Joe Stelmacher, he's coaching back at his hometown in Berlin, and uh, a few years ago year and a half ago he called me and he's like i got this kid from Watoma. he's an absolute monster um would you mind giving him some tips and kind of helping him with technique and stuff so i'm like yeah sure no no big deal and i've kind of gone through this scenario a few times with some people and you see the kid and you're like eh, yeah i mean he's, he's a good kid it'll be it'll be a project I don't know. so i went to go see his kid play basketball and i walked in look we all know what it was like the first time we saw Joe Thomas, right? Like the guy was different, very different. Mike's different. <laughs> Mike is raw. He is, he does not have the, the, he didn't come from Brookfield or any of these big high schools where these, these guys are used to putting out D1 players. So he's got a lot of work out of him, but he is one of the best overall athletes at his size I have ever seen. Hands down. He's insanely athletic. Um, and he had the he had the injury, but he's rehabbed it very well. He's doing great. Um, it was a week and a half ago we worked. Um, and his technique is he's really starting to get critical on his own technique and, and understanding like I keep harping that attention to detail. You know, we'd watch film and He'd be like, look, I threw this guy on the floor. Look, I threw him on the ground. And I'm like, you're supposed to, Mike. You're huge. This is Watoma. You're not going to throw that guy at the next level on the ground. He's going to throw you on the ground. So you got to learn technique. And he's, he's picked it up. He's embracing it. He's learning. Uh, and, of course, you know, no matter what you are in high school, you make that transition. Everyone has that awful time where you just feel like you're not going to make it. Um, and we'll have those conversations at that time, but, um, yeah, I think he's going to be a, an amazing, amazing player there. Um, and we'll just keep working on understanding, like I've, I've kind of worked on concepts of double teams and, and looking up to the second level and learning things that, um, learned from coach Christ and how fast he changed everything, including my entire life. That one year I had him as a tight ends coach, the man's amazing. Um, so yeah, he'll he'll have a good career, I think. Well, I know a lot of fans are very excited about him because, like you said, like he moves so incredibly well for a kid who's six, seven, three hundred, whatever his exact you know it's, measurables are. He, he moves so naturally. So, but then you watch the film, and it looks like he's playing against fifth graders. Um, like, you know, some of these defense is. ends might be you know five four, a buck twenty. It seems sometimes, so it can be really hard to gauge. But I know that you know a uh, everyone appreciates you uh, hopping on with us here today. This is absolutely. Oh.
fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we all have meetings and uh, business to get back to. But I could listen to I could listen to Bernie stories and seminary stories for days. So um, maybe we'll have a seminary special. Get some get, get for like a we'll have to start a, we'll have to start a, a Patreon for a subscription only uh, NC seventeen rated seminary stories sometime. Um, until yeah. then. Yeah, let's- <laughs> those those would you definitely have to have a subscription only. So maybe some waivers. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have NDAs for the podcast. So yeah, um, yeah. until that happens, though, uh, we want to thank everyone uh, for tuning in to Believe in Badgers on the Believe Network, presented by BetOnline.ag and Oak Bridge Wealth Management. Um, thank you. Please subscribe, rev- rate, review, all that good stuff. And uh, until next time, on Wisconsin. <laughs>